morning. It was a few years ago, and I was on a website called GodIsImaginary.com. And, and this website was designed to convince people that God wasn't real, that he was just, you know, a myth, uh, just a part of our imagination. And it, it gave a list of, of all the reasons why you, you shouldn't believe in God. And, and, and there was a statement in there that it attracted my eye, and it, and it was this. It said, wouldn't you expect, if there is an all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, that he would communicate with such a message that it would blow us all completely away. And I read that and I said, well, he did. He absolutely did. And, and, and then they were basically saying, this is a reason why not to believe God. And then and my thought was, you obviously have never read the Bible and you obviously don't believe in Jesus because to read the Bible is to be absolutely blown away. <laughs> by the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe, and then to know his son, our savior, is to be blown away. But, but I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you feel like, I just, I don't know. I mean, does God still speak? Does he speak to me? I, I, I don't hear his voice. Sometimes I don't feel his presence. Maybe you struggle with doubt, and, 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 and maybe you would, you know, find yourself uh, struggling like whoever wrote this website. And if that's the case, actually, I'm super glad, friends, that, that you're here as we begin our study in the letter to the Hebrews, because this book will blow you away. It absolutely will, because it's going to reveal to you the truth about our superior Savior, who is Jesus Christ. There's, there's, there's only going to be one of two options. You're either going to, if you stay with us and study this with us, you're either going to come to the conclusion that Jesus is the most incredible person who is also God our Savior, and he is the one who is superior to everything, or you're just going to have to say, I don't believe it. And, and if there is a Jesus, he's an absolute lunatic or a liar. You can't. It's, it's, it's going to be one or the other, because you cannot look at what the Bible says about him and, and come to any other type of conclusion. And so it is a really important study for us. And, and by the way, uh, if you want to follow along and take notes, this is a great uh, series to take a bunch of notes. So we have these scripture notebooks, which has the Hebrews uh, text on one side and place for notes. You can pick one of those up as you leave today to follow along. All right, now, I think the problem actually is, is not whether or not God speaks. I think the problem is, is are we listening? That's the problem. And so I really hope you'll have your spiritual ears on as we study this book together. Now, let me give you a little background about Hebrews. All right, so New Testament uh, is called the Letter to the Hebrews, which means that it was written for a primarily Jewish Christian context, all right? Jewish Christian. That's the primary audience for this letter, and that Jewish Christian context would have been in a local church, all right? So we've got, we've got, Jews who became followers of Jesus, and they're in the church that's struggling because of Roman persecution. So maybe around the time of Emperor Nero or, or close to that, and, and if you recall, there's just a lot of persecution going on for the church, and as a result, actually, some within the church left. They said, I'm out. I don't want anything to do with this. This is too difficult, and they didn't endure. So even some who had initially claimed to be Christians proved not to be. They didn't persevere. And so this letter was written as an encouragement for the church to persevere because of who Jesus is. And, and the letter uh, to the Hebrews is going to remind us just how superior Christ is to everything. And, and, and I'm going to be challenging you to make him superior not just superior to all the things that you desire in life. I, I want you to make Christ superior to the things that you're most afraid of and to the things you doubt the most, the things that, that cause you to struggle at times. I want to know if Christ is superior not just to all the good things, but is he superior to the bad things? 
because making him superior to everything is what will change you, my friends. And, and, and the, these Jewish Christians needed to hear that. Some were struggling. And by the way, when you see someone that you think's a believer and they leave the faith, it rocks your world. And, and so this letter was written as an encouragement that you can persevere because of who Jesus is. Now, we don't know who wrote the letter to the Hebrews historically. This letter was attributed to the Apostle Paul. A lot of people think that's the case. Uh, we don't know. Uh, the author is anonymous. I kind of like that, actually. I, mean, I kind of find that interesting to me. I mean, some suggest maybe it was a guy like Apollos, the great preacher, or, or Barnabas, the, 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 the apostle who, who had so much love and care and concern for the church. Or maybe, in my heart, I was thinking maybe it's just this, this absolute faithful pastor of a primarily Jewish Christian congregation in the early church. Maybe he wrote it because I'm, I'm convinced that Hebrews is actually given to us as a sermon, right? It just is laid out perfectly as an expositional sermon. And so if you really want to know what a really good sermon would have been like during the New Testament times, here you have it right here. I mean, we don't have many sermons contained. Here's one, which, by the way, if you read it from beginning to end, would take you well over an hour. So I'm sorry that I preached so short. I'm going to try to get the elders to encourage me to work on that a little bit more. But yeah, de definitely this is a solid message that you would hear uh, in the early church. Now, to be honest, um, there has to be some influence of Paul. I mean, Paul's theology is all throughout this. To be, I think also, to be honest, that, that, Greeks, uh, that Luke's Greek is in this letter, much of what we see in the original language. So maybe there was someone who knew Luke and Paul. Maybe Paul wrote a sermon, Luke transcribed. I don't know. All I know is we have this incredible message for us that's going to help us in so many ways. Now, now, what what will Hebrews help us with? First of all, this letter is going to help us persevere and never fall away or abandon the faith. If you really listen and, and buy into what this letter is going to teach, you'll persevere. It will help you. Secondly, it's going to help you make Christ the center of your life. And when Christ is the center of your life, everything then gets easy, my friends, because he's in control. And, and, and your life is just transformed when Christ is at the center. It's also going to help us to appreciate the perfect sacrifice of Christ. We're going to see Jesus as the superior mediator and as the superior priest and as the and giving him himself as the superior sacrifice. And we're going to appreciate what Christ did for us all the more. And finally, Hebrews is going to really help us to know what it means to live by faith. This letter is huge on how you can live out your faith as a Christian. And, and, and what you're going to see at the very end is there's going to be an entire chapter that's going to be devoted to some faithful uh, brothers and sisters of old, all going all the way back to Abraham, and just the stories of their faithfulness, and even some some names that that we will not know until we get to heaven of people who who lived for Christ and and gave their life, uh, believing, and and they're in heaven as well. And then it's gonna it's gonna say that all of these faithful brothers and sisters, do you know what they're doing? They're in heaven watching you like this great cloud of witnesses. They're watching you. And they're like, come on, you can do this. You can endure. You can make it to the end. Don't fall away. Don't give up now. You can make it. There's so much in store. And so there's an encouragement for you to persevere and live with victory and, and make it until the end. For some of you, that's not too long from now. Some of you, that's a long ways from now. Regardless, live by faith because of Christ. All right, let me read these first four verses, and then we're just going to dig in. This is God's word to the church then and today. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And God has appointed him 
heir of all things and made the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became superior even to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Father, as we begin this journey through Hebrews, I pray everyone's life would be transformed, that we would all be changed into the image of our superior Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, for those who, who may not know Christ as we know him, maybe this study will bring them a saving knowledge of the only one who can give them life now to the full and life eternal. Pray that they might believe as we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to take these verses and break them down because this is uh, a passage of Scripture. It's one of the most dense passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. And so every phrase, every word is important. And so let's just begin line by line here where um, the author of Hebrews begins by saying, long ago God spoke to our ancestors. All right, now what's important to that, my friends, is first of all, is the declaration of God in the beginning, God. And now the author of Hebrews just takes us back to that place where he says, from eternity past, there was God. And in a moment, God spoke. And we know from Genesis when God spoke, everything that was made, uh, that has been made, was made in an instant. God spoke and he revealed himself. Now, let me tell you why this is important for us today. Not only can we know that our God spoke because we exist, but also God spoke and we have this book. We have this book. And this book becomes to us, special revelation of the divine person that we call God. We know God because of this book. He gave us this book, and this book is communication. This book is revelation. And so if the question is, do you want to hear the voice of God, then I hope that you do ask that question. The answer is yes. Just pick up the book and read it. If you want God to speak to you, simply read the book. Now, how did God reveal himself? Well, he revealed himself in through different prophets, and he revealed himself to different prophets in different ways. And so every book of the Old Testament, as we have been studying it, uh, was written down by various individuals. We've been focusing our attention a lot on Moses recently because there is this a really important relationship between the books of the law and the book of Hebrews. And we're going to see that in our study. But God spoke through prophets such as Moses and, and then through Joshua and, and David and Solomon and then the great prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and on and on it goes. And what happened, you see, is that as God was revealing himself and revealing his word, these particular prophets then wrote down the texts of Scripture as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so it was the Spirit of God who inspired these men to write down the Word of God. And we have all of that contained in this fabulous, miraculous book that we call the Bible. Peter helps us to understand this. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, But know first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What does that mean? That means when, when old Moses was sitting there on the foothills of the mountains overlooking the Jordan River into Canaan, and he was inspired by God to write down some books so that the Israelites could carry 
a remembrance of what all that God has done uh, into the promised land as Moses is writing down from Genesis to Deuteronomy, in the very same moment that he was writing down, the Spirit of God was carrying him along to write down every word and every part of every word so that when Moses concluded his writing, the Spirit of God then concluded, this is exactly what I want my people to hear. And so we have a human author, Moses, and a divine author, the Spirit of God, that work perfectly in tangent together so that every word that we find in Scripture is the Word of God. Because it came from God, that makes it infallible. There is nothing that is false within it. It is true and trustworthy in every way. It is also inerrant. There's not an error, not in any big part of it, nor in any small part of it. It is perfect, just as it says. And so then when people say, God doesn't speak to me, they must not be reading the book. Because if you want God to speak to you, just then read it. If you want God to speak to you audibly, read it out loud. You can take your phone and press record and start reading it, and then you'll hear the voice of God. If you don't like your voice, get a voice that you like and have them read the scriptures and play it back. Every time you read the book, hear the book, you're hearing God's voice. And that, my friends, will change you. You want to be blown away, read the book. There was some important church father, we call him Augustine or Augustine, and he was struggling with sexual sin, and, and the Spirit of God was moving upon him, and, and he was confused, and, and in, in his own autobiography, he says, it is as if I heard God said to me, take up the book and read it, tola lege. and he did, and he picked up the book, and he read from Romans, and it transformed his life. He was a new man. He was born again by reading God's word long ago god spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways god revealed himself through moses in a burning bush god revealed himself through joshua by this commanding general of the army god revealed himself to elijah both in in the ground and in the still small voice over and over and over maybe through a donkey maybe through the wind maybe through a small child god revealed himself but what we have is god revealing himself in these pages and so we know there is a god we know he still speaks because we have this book and the word of god is a living book god is alive which means that what he said is alive and so this book is a living revelation of God. He spoke to our ancestors by the prophets. But now, verse 2, in these last days, if you'll read on, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, first of all, in these last days. And so there is this bridge that the author of Hebrews is making from B.C. to A.D., from the Old Covenant now to the New. And the bridge then is the result of God providing us a new era of time, a new covenant relationship where the Old Covenant was for the nation of Israel. The New Covenant is for the people of God that we call the church. And this new era, this cataclysmically new era of time began when Jesus of Nazareth walked into a synagogue and he picked up the scroll of Isaiah and he read it and then he put it down and he said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus was announcing that the new era had begun, the new covenant era. He said, my kingdom is now at hand. And we are living in those days from the moment Jesus declared that until Jesus returns to culminate his kingdom. All of that time period is the last days. You know you're living in these last days. Just look around. We know that we are living in the end times. And whether they last another thousand years or maybe Jesus will return tomorrow. I just want to hold my new granddaughter and then he can come. But these are the last times. And, and in these last days, look very clearly, he has spoken to us by his son. I'm not the voice of God. 
but Jesus is. You're not the revelation of God, but Jesus is. Jesus is the greatest act of communication by the divine God that the world has ever known. So important is it that you understand that, that the gospel writer John gave a special word for Jesus, and that word was word. In the beginning was the what? The communication of God, the logos. The revelation of God, the truth of God, contained in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke, God spoke. Everything about Jesus is God revealing himself. He spoke to us through his son. And now what the author of Hebrews is going to do is he's going to begin to talk about Jesus. And he's going to begin to brag about Jesus. And he's going to stack attribute after attribute after attribute about Jesus, one on top of the other, to the point where we go, okay, this is not just some good prophet or amazing teacher. This is not just an interesting guy. This man must be God himself. Because look how the author of the Hebrews describes to us. First of all, we know that it is God himself who speaks through his son. He is the communication of God, the revelation of God, and God has appointed him heir of all things. Now, not heir of some things, but heir of all things. What does that mean? That means Jesus owns everything. That means it all belongs to him. That means that Jesus has claimed the highest position of authority. And God has promised his creation to his son. Everything belongs to Christ. Now, here's, what's, uh, here's some good news for you. Jesus likes to share. He likes to share. And according to the letter to the church at Ephesus and some other places, Jesus is offering his church to be a co-heir with him. Jesus is heir. That's his rightful position. Why? He's the firstborn son. He deserves everything. It all belongs to him. And yet he comes alongside his church and he says, you want to share this with me? You can have it. You know, we're going to laugh in heaven. And here's one of the things we're going to laugh about. All the stuff you are concerned about. All the stuff. You're concerned about your finances. You're concerned about your bills. You're concerned about what you don't have and how are you going to get in all these little matters. You're going to be in heaven one day in year 2 billion and 18. And the vastness of the universe will belong to you. And you're like, what were we thinking? Why were we so concerned about all that stuff? Jesus is going to share all of it with his church. How can that be true? Because we're going to be married to him. At least in my will, it says she gets everything. She's my co-heir. And we are the same. As the bride of Christ, the church is the co-heir. And he, being appointed heir of all things, then uh, will provide that for us. But, but, but now... Why does he get to be heir of all things? The next phrase is this, and made the universe through him. He gets to be heir of all things because he made all things. Yes, our incredible triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, created the universe. But in particular, we know that the universe was made by the powerful word of the word. God's Son, Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God from the beginning, and all things were made through Him. It was Jesus who made the stars in the sky. It was Jesus who made the depths of the seas. It was Jesus who made you. It doesn't matter what you claim to believe or not. You were made. That means you belong. 
and aren't you happy you belong to your maker today? I hope you know him. I hope you do. I don't need any more proofs than that. I just need to look out, know that God created, and then I need to look in and find out who this God is. And when I look in, that God is named, has a name. It's Jesus Christ. It's all I need to know. He made the universe through him. And, 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 and now it's where I begin to see these attributes. Talk about getting blown away. This is where I begin to get blown away about this person, Jesus. Now let's go to verse 3. We're going to see now how Christ is revealed as being superior and all-sufficient. Verse 3. The Son, that's in reference to Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. If you go to the book of Revelation, it gives a, a heavenly description of Jesus, and it talks about him radiating the fiery glory of God. Now, it is impossible for me to give you a, a word picture or an analogy that can properly represent Jesus' relationship with the Father. It's impossible for me to describe the Trinity with clarity. But, but there are some word pictures that help us to, to at least begin to get there. And this, this concept of radiance is one. So think about it this way. Uh, think about uh, radiating something like, like, like looking in a mirror. So I'm guessing this morning you woke up, at some moment you were in your bathroom, and you looked in the mirror. Now, whatever you saw, that's between you and the Lord. But let me tell you what, what you saw was, was you being radiated from that mirror. That was you. And obviously, y'all, whatever you did next was good. You look beautiful today, and so good job. But, you, but that's it. The, that mirror radiated your image, your person. And, and that's what the author of Hebrews is trying to say. Do you want to know who God is? Look to Jesus. He radiates the glory of God. And what a glorious God he is. So yesterday morning, Kay and I get up 6 a.m.-ish Turkish time and getting our stuff together and head to the airport. By the time we get on the plane, it's, it's, it's getting super hot in Turkey. So it's 100 plus degrees. And, and then we had to walk down onto the tarmac and then walk over to walk up onto the plane. And, uh, and now it's 105 degrees. That's just above the tarmac. And the sun's heat was radiating off that cement. And we could just feel and experience it just burning. And I was thinking about this passage of Scripture. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews is trying to get across. Just the, the radiating, blaring glory of God. That's Jesus Christ. And he, he hid that. Right, Peter and James and John got a glimpse of that on the Mount of Transfiguration. When you go to Revelation, then you see the fullness of this. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. He he radiates the glory of God, and 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 not only that. The next phrase tells us, and he is the exact expression of his nature. Okay, now that phrase. Are you with me? Jesus is the exact expression of his nature. You cannot state it more clearly than that. Jesus Christ is God. He is exactly God. He is the, the exact nature of God. Like whatever substance God is, that's who Jesus is. Jesus has that stuff. Whatever the nature of God is, whatever the God stuff is, you don't have it, I don't have it, Jesus has it. He is God. Uh, the word picture here is the imprint, like on some wax, and you make an imprint of it. That representation of the person, that's Jesus. Jesus is God made visible. The invisible God now is seen because Jesus took on humanity. Now we can see him. John said, and I saw his glory. The glory as the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. And, and the disciples saw him to the point where, at the very end, Thomas, who didn't believe, and Jesus said, you want to touch my scars, 
Thomas knelt down before Jesus the man and declared him to be Jesus his God. He said, my Lord and my God. Not just a good man. Not just a prophet. He's God. That makes him greater than Muhammad. That makes him greater than Buddha. That, that makes him greater than, than all of the cult leaders. It makes him greater. He's greater than the prophet. He's God. He's the exact expression of that. When the Pharisees tried to, to, to denounce him and they tried to rebuke him and they tried to silence him and, and, and the people in Jerusalem were believing Jesus simply, he said to them, you know, you believe in Abraham, but before Abraham existed, I existed. And they say, are you kidding me? Abraham died thousands of years ago. How can you tell me that our father Abraham, uh, that, that you existed before him? He said, it's easy. <laughs> I made him. John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, I am, I am. Jesus declared himself that eternal name of Yahweh, Jehovah. I am that I am, the eternally existing God who made all things. That's our Savior. And not only did he make all things, and not only is he the exact expression or nature of God, he sustains all things. And he sustains all things by his powerful wor word. Now, it's really important for you to understand that. Because there's some people who say, yeah, I believe in God. I just don't believe he's really involved that much. Yeah, I think he's out there and maybe he made everything. But, I mean, everything else is left to us. Friends, that, that could not be further from the truth. Just as Jesus actively made everything, he this moment is actively sustaining all things by the power of his word. Your heart is Beating because of the sustaining power of Jesus Christ. You are breathing air that he made because of the sustaining power of Jesus Christ. Whatever happens to you today, Jesus ordained. Now, I want you to listen to me. If something difficult or bad happens to you today or tomorrow, Jesus ordained it. You can't just say, I believe this part of Jesus, but not all of it. And the reason why the bad things will happen is because they happen to him and he wants you to end up looking like him. He wants you to pass the test of trial so that you'll end up looking more like him. I don't like the trials that God's put in my life. You know, I don't like watching loved ones die too early. It's part of my family. I don't like the heartaches. I don't like the misery. I don't like it. But I believe that everything was determined by the sovereign hand of Jesus so that I might inch by inch become more like him. That's why. So you can complain about it or you can, you can struggle with it. And, and that's a part of it. But you cannot deny that all the, the tough stuff is not a part of, of Jesus Christ sustaining your life so in the end you, you will be like him. He suffered giving you an example. He's the sustainer. If you don't believe that, you're really going to struggle in life because you're just going to throw your hands up and go, I have no idea, God, what you're doing. To believe this is, God, you know exactly what you're doing. If you don't mind, reveal it to me. If not, whether I live, whether I die, your will be done. He sustains all things by his powerful word. Now you say, I'm not going to buy into that. I don't want that, God. Well, the last phrase is after making purification of sins. My friends, if you don't buy into the first part, there's no way your sins can be forgiven. Because he's the only one that can cleanse you from your sinfulness. Now you... You're a sinner, right? Say amen. Yeah, of course. But you, you can't take care of your sin. What do you do with it? You can only go to the word of God who is the maker of all things, sustainer of all things, the superior savior who by himself 
by himself, offered himself as the purification sacrifice for your sins. Moses, you see, had to do it in a different way because that's, that's see, Hebrews is going to be the superior uh, covenant to what was old. In the old covenant, this covenant was, was written on, on stone tablets. It was outside of Israel. The new covenant is written where? On our hearts. It's inside of us. The old covenant mediator was Moses. <laughs> and he said, you got to bring all these animals and offer their blood. And all it was was temporary covering. Nothing, nothing eternal. But in the new covenant, we have Jesus. He's the greater Moses. He's the greater high priest than Aaron. And he said, you don't need to bring animals anymore and sacrifice them. I'll, I'll shed my blood instead. I'll die in your place. He came to purify our sins. That's why in the old covenant, Israel didn't have a chance. They were not going to persevere. But in the new covenant, because it's bound up in Jesus and his blood sacrifice, the church will endure. That is an absolute promise. And so Jesus cleanses us from the ugly stain of sin. He purifies us. He forgives us. He removes the guilt. And after he did that on the cross, they buried his dead body. It rose from the grave. And then he ascended back to heaven a few days later so that he might sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high. After his humiliation came his exaltation. And now at the very highest place, in the most important place in the universe, Jesus Christ reigns. He alone deserves that place. And there our Savior sits. So obviously, verse 4, he is superior to the angels because he has been given the greater name. He has been given the name above all names. So at the name of Jesus, all those angels will bow down one day. And we're going to learn more about that next week. But now I got to finish. I have to ask the question, is this the Jesus that you know? Is this your Jesus? There's just a lot of Jesuses out there. And there's a lot of fake Jesuses and a lot of false Jesuses. But this is the only one true Jesus. This is the only Jesus that can save you and sustain you. Do you know this? Do you believe in Jesus who is the word of God, who is the heir of all things, who made all things, who sustains all things? Do you believe that this is the Jesus who is the exact representation of God? This is the one who can save you from your sins. This is the one who is king over all and reigns over all kingdoms. This Jesus who is the voice of God. He's, he's the divine son. He's, he's the heavenly heir. He's, he is the eternal maker. He is the radiance of God's glory. He, he is God made visible. And yes, he sustains. And yes, he's superior. But, but now, now let me get even more personal. Is Jesus superior to the things that you desire most? If not, then you have a different God. You have an idol instead of a Lord. If Jesus is not superior to the things you desire the most, then the idol in your heart is more important. Now, let me, let me add to that. Is Jesus superior to the thing that you fear the most? What's bigger, your greatest fear or Jesus? Because if Jesus is bigger, then guess what? His perfect love casts out all fear. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Is Jesus more important than the things you want the most? If so, then guess what? You can live content because you have all of Jesus. If the things you want the most are more than you want Jesus, then you're going to struggle in life. You're not going to have contentment. Is Jesus superior than your doubts? 
is he superior? If not, my friends, my heart breaks for you. That's a difficult life to live. When doubt, depression, fear overwhelm you. Can I suggest something? He's greater. He's greater. He is our all-sufficient, superior Savior, and He offers to us a better life. I hope you'll choose to receive it.